Good morning. My name is Daniel Buplitz. I'm the Director of Sugar Beet Advancement, and I'd like to thank you for joining us for the virtual field day today. I'm going to start by talking about the Sugar Beet Advancement Variety Trials. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with these trials, they are large plot strip trials, which we conduct with growers throughout the area. In these trials, we compare 12 different sugar beet varieties, which the Sugar Beet Advancement Committee has selected. These beets are grown and maintained by the sugar beet farmer, just like he'd maintain all the rest of his beets. Then at the end of the season, we collect yield data from them to see how each variety performed under that management system. Throughout the growing season, we scout the trials several times, checking them for quality, as well as for different agronomic traits the beets possess. These include emergence, tolerance to foliar and root diseases, and the impact of sugar beet cyst nematode. This year, we have a total of seven variety trials, six of which are located here in Michigan, and one more that's located in Ontario, Canada. Today, we are at the trial which is managed by Wadsworth Farms, east of Sandusky. This trial was planted on April 6th, and shortly after planting, it experienced several nights of freezing temperatures. Unfortunately, this, along with some cresting issues that we had in the field, led to a lower emergence than what we had hoped for. In fact, we had some stand counts which were as low as 60 beets in 100 feet of row, which that's right on the line as to whether or not we should replant the trial, and we agonized over that decision for about a week. Eventually, the grower came up with a solution that provides a unique educational opportunity for the rest of the farmers in the co-op. So he decided to replant the trial, and we did so on May 7th. But instead of uh, tearing out the old trial, he actually planted the new trial adjacent to that one. So now we basically have two variety trials at this location, one with an earlier planting date, but with a lower stand, and another with a later planting date, but a near perfect stand. So I'm actually standing in the early planted trial right now, and you can see that the stand is a little bit lighter here. You can see a couple of patches in the beets. With these two parts of the trial, we hope to determine if replanting this field was the correct decision in this particular situation. Since planting, there are two major factors which have influenced these trials. The first of these is sugar beet cyst nematode. Unfortunately, there's a high level of sugar beet cyst nematode in this field, and in fact, you can actually see a visual difference in the beets between the susceptible and resistant varieties. So behind me, you can see two such varieties, with the variety on the right being resistant to sugar beet cyst nematode, and the one on the left being susceptible to it. You can see that the resistant variety has a little bit darker green color, and a little, a little bit more full canopy, whereas the susceptible variety has a little bit lighter canopy and is more of a lime green color. Here, we have an example of a sugar beet that is susceptible to a sugar beet cyst nematode. You can see that there are several little white dots which have formed on the root hairs of this beet. Those are actually the cysts created by the nematode. So if you can find cysts like this on sugar beets from your farm, you should definitely consider planting a nematode resistant variety the next time that you plant beets there. The second major factor influencing this trial is the presence of root disease. So I've actually found a couple of different root diseases in this field, but the primary one appears to be Rhizectonia crown and root rot. And the amount of disease that we found in this field has varied based on the varietal tolerance. So some varieties which are susceptible have more disease, and those that are tolerant have less disease. So behind me, we have a variety that's susceptible to Rhizectonia crown and root rot. You can see that there is a large patch of beets that have been infected by the disease and that are being killed because of it. These are two examples of sugar beets showing symptoms of Rhizoctonia root rot. You can see that this is a very dry rot and it's very dark in color, nearly black even. As you can see in the cross section, this is a very shallow rot which starts from the outside of the beet and works its way into the, to the inside. There's a very clearly defined line between the infected and healthy tissue. Now I'm going to shift gears and show you an aerial image that was taken of this trial. The first thing you probably notice is the difference in stand count between the early and the late parts of the trial. In the early section, you can notice there is quite a reduced stand as opposed to the late part of the trial. 
The next thing I'm sure that you notice is that there are definitely large patches of beets that have been uh, affected by root rot in both the early and the late planting sections. Finally, you can notice some sharp differences in leaf color and canopy size between the different varieties in both parts of the trial. It'll be interesting to see how all these factors come together to influence the yield of each variety. Once the results are collected from this trial, as well as the other sugar beet advancement trials and the Michigan sugar variety trials, they will be compiled into the 2020 REACH Variety Trial Book, which will be sent out later this fall. The next project I'm going to discuss is a new one for sugar beet advancement, which is a Cercospora leaf spot fungicide resistance screening project. As you are all painfully aware, fungicide resistance is a major problem for managing Cercospora leaf spot. Two fungicides in particular which have a problem with resistance are the strobilarins, which include products such as Headline, Gem, and Flint Extra, as well as the benzimidazoles, which include Topsin. If, you, if your Cercospora has resistance to these fungicides, they will be much less effective, but unfortunately, most growers have no way of knowing what level of fungicide resistance they have in their field. Therefore, the goal of this project is to provide you with in-season information as to the level of resistance in your field. This information can be taken, and with the help of your Michigan Sugar Field Consultant, you can optimize your fungicide program with it. In addition, this will provide valuable information to researchers about how Cercospora fungicide resistance is changing throughout the area and throughout the season. Now, I'm going to take a moment to discuss how this project will work. First, you'll need to identify Cercospora leaf spot in your field. I know Jamie Wilbur is probably going to talk more about this in her presentation, but what you're looking for with Stercospora lesion is a small circular lesion that's about an eighth to a quarter of an inch wide. These lesions will be a tan or ash gray color in the center, and they'll have reddish purple or brown borders. The two most important features that you're looking for with Stercospora are these black dots in the center of the lesions, which are called pseudostromata, as well as the formation of silver needle-like canidia, like it's in the bottom picture. If you identify Cercospora leaf spot in your field, the next step is then to collect leaves that have Cercospora on them. The way you're going to do this is by taking your sugar beet leaf and breaking it off where the petiole and the leaf blade come together, just like that. Once you have your, your leaf samples, you want to eventually collect 10 of those randomly from throughout the field. Now, I know it's going to be easier to collect those samples all from one spot, but that won't really give you the best results and won't really give you the best picture as to fungicide resistance in your field. So once you have your 10 samples, you want to take a one gallon Ziploc bag that's been pre-labeled with the date and the field location. You want to take your samples, place them inside the bag, then seal that bag. If you're uncomfortable with collecting these samples by yourself, you can call your local field consultant to assist you with that. Once the samples are collected, your field consultant will take them to a central drop-off point, and from there, they will be delivered to Saginaw Valley State University, where Dr. Dennis Gray and his team will conduct a PCR test on them. This test will allow us to see if these samples are resistant to either the benzimidazoles or the strobilarins. Here to talk more about what's gonna happen in the lab for this project is Dr. Dennis Gray. Hello, my name is Dr. Dennis Gray. I'm part of the, uh, the SPSU component of the Cercospora re uh, Resistance Screening Project. Uh, my collaborator and, and student, Kelsey Lewis, is doing the filming on this right, this right now. What we're gonna do is tell you just a little bit about how we, what we do with the samples you give to us and a bit about how we extract information from that. So coming from the field, we will be receiving from you sugar beet leaves. Now this one looks rather pathetic because it has been in the refrigerator for almost a month at this point, but this leaf still is giving us good, is giving us good information. So we start off by receiving samples from the field. At that point, we will then identify the, the spots that are indicative of Cercospora infection. And from those spots, we will then extract some, extract some DNA. That DNA we will then send through this, this procedure called the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, which serves to amplify DNA into, well, amplify sections of the DNA molecule 
the molecule up into large numbers of copies. Now, some of these copies of the DNA molecule will possess mutations that can be, be uh, cut by a particular enzyme called the restriction enzyme. Other copies will not possess that mutation, and so they will not be cut. After we've done the PCR, we do this restriction digest, which will either cut or not cut particular fragments. Those fragments which are not cut indicate that the, the Cercospora uh, fungus that was present in, in the spots is not resistant to the, fun, to the target fungicide that we're examining. Those uh, sections, that those fragments which do get cut, that indicates that the, the Cercospora um, uh, genotypes will be resistant to the particular fungicide that we are, we are examining. That's what we see here. If you have a full-length uh, piece of DNA, it's uncut. If it's cut, it'll be broken up into small fragments. And we can determine whether something is cut or uncut by running these fragments out on something called a gel. Kind of looks like a little piece of jello. You put the DNA solution into a set of little, little depressions, little wells, apply a voltage across the gel that will cause the DNA to move. And then, depending upon the number of bands that we see in the gel after it has been stained, that will tell us what, whether or not something has been cut or uncut. If, it's, if it does not cut, we'll just see a single band. If there are multiple bands, that indicates that it has been cut at that particular, that particular site. Not, uh, uncut indicates that it's resistant genotype. Cut, uh, sorry, uncut, it's not resistant. Cut, it indicates that it is a resistant genotype. Once the results have been compiled, they will be sent to your local field consultant, who will then distribute them to you. I re I'm really excited about this project, as I think it has the potential to greatly improve our fungicide programs, as well as provide a lot of valuable information to the researchers about Cercospora fungicide resistance. Historically, August has been a time when Cercospora leaf spots have really ramped up in the field, so you still have plenty of time to take advantage of this project, and I would encourage you all to do so. I would like to thank you again for joining us for this virtual field day. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them at this time, or you can contact me later.